the Part of the Culture Podcast. What's going on, Joe? What's going on, JD? We're back here in, uh, in my office at uh, Live, Work, Play, Connect, Silicon Valley here in uh, downtown San Jose. Yeah. And um, we're running the back. Got to run it back. So. You know, JD and myself. And uh, today, a lot of our topics are going to be about um, the nightlife industry, how we got started, and how things have changed over the years, how we evolved, how we've grown, how you know we've taken a few steps back, a few steps forward, and we'll just kind of see where we go. Yes, we will. We, only time will tell with this nightclub thing. I take it a day at a time. So, man, I feel like uh, I asked Joe what does he want to talk about. He came up with the nightlife thing, so I'm going to let him ask some questions, start the conversation. So, ask away, man. What did, why, actually, I'll ask a question. What made you want to choose that that topic? Um, I think it's something that we both know a lot about. It's something that you know we have a lot of experience in, and I mean we both get asked this question all the time. People always want to know how did we get our jobs, you know? And people do ask that a lot all the time. People are like, how do you get that job? That's like the cool job. And everybody <laughs> wants to be a bartender. Like it's, I think about it and like. I don't want to say I want to get out of the industry because if I wanted to get out of the industry, I would get out. But it's not like as glamorous as you would think. When you're young, I would say from like 21 to 24, it's fun. It's a great industry to be in. But bartending after after you, after like 24, 25, if you're not like running your own club and getting all of the money, it's a, it, it's a different beast. I'm, I don't mind it because it's straight cash. Every time I work, you leave with cash, and you can make a lot of cash. Except, I mean, last night, I didn't leave with any cash, but that's a, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, that's rare, you know? <laughs> and it's part of the game. It's anything. I don't care if you have a business, sort of like working a job where no matter what, you get paid. But if you have a business or anything, you're going to have up days, you're going to have down days. And bartending's closer to, like, a business. It depends on how busy it is in order for you to make income. But I think that people think it's a lot more glamorous than it is. What do you think about it? Oh yeah, that people will definitely think it's way more glamorous than what it is. They don't see the grind. They don't see the hours we put in, you know, behind the scenes. There's a lot of stuff, you know, they just don't see. They think it's just we open the doors and it's just women in champagne every single night when there's a lot more that goes into the There is business. women in champagne. Well, there, there is. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely women in champagne in the nightlife. But yeah. it's, it is, there's a lot more to the women and the champagne. That's actually more of a marketing thing then like it's not like me and joe just sit and drink champagne with beautiful women we serve them drinks they say thank you and then they walk away from the bar sometimes when you're younger they'll flirt with you so actually you know a lot of girls flirt with you as a bartender i don't know why bartenders there's like a, a groupy thing that goes on like bartenders definitely have a groupy thing i think it's more of the alcohol but i definitely think it increases your chance of getting laid tenfold if you're a bartender sure <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm not going to get into that, but all right. yes, yes, it definitely does. Um, I'm going to get into it. Yeah, all right. I'm just playing. But <laughs> it, it, it is. I, I, there's definitely, like, there's definitely pros. I think the cons to bartending are you give up a huge part of your life. I think that a lot of people who get to go out, you know, they work their 9 to 5, and then, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they get to go to Tahoe. They get to go, you know, on trips. They get to hang out with their family. They get to hang out with their close buds. They get to go to the club. They get to pop bottles. If, you, if you're if you in the nightlife, you give up a huge percent of that. It's not like I've never been a Tahoe and it's not like I've ever never popped a bottle. But I've definitely given up a huge part of my life because, you know, instead of being able to just dip out to... My family's from L.A. Instead of just being able to leave from L.A., I have to put in a two re request. Or I can only go one time a month. Because I can't take, you can't, if you're going to bartend, you can't take every weekend off. Or I have to, you know, so pretty much if there's 12 months in a year, I can only do 12 activities. I can maybe get away with taking one weekend off. And if you think about it, that's a lot at a job. To, yes. take, to take one, you know, two days off every month at a job is a lot. But, so it's, it, you do give up a lot. You give up time with your family, you give up time with your friends, you give up time to people who really love you. Yep, yep, and no, I feel you on that. I know because... I make it a point to say, take my vacations Monday through Thursday or something like that. Yeah. That way I can have my weekend for uh, the nightlife, for the clubs, for the bars, because 
you know, taking a weekend off, that's, you know, taking a hit to my bank account, to that yeah. cash money. and It does take a hit. It does take a hit. I think the pro, I think why I stayed in bartending so long is I've always had a silk screen and clothing business and bartending was, it allowed me to do that business during the day and then make enough money to like as a safety net job at night. So it kept me going in business for a really long time, um, pretty much 10 years. And just recently I got a day job, but I, I'm, I haven't had a day job since I turned 32, you know, so I was able to survive just off of bartending and my business forever up until you know now i'm getting want to get married so I'm, i have to think about the bigger picture but bartending definitely definitely uh saved my butt and it definitely is where i met probably like three out of four of my girlfriends but go ahead <laughs> uh so you know how did you how did joe sexual get into uh the bartending the nightlife i really don't know your origin story let 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 the viewers know how did you get into bartending well bartending was just kind of something i just hopped into um, when I was uh, managing a Vault Ultra Lounge. You know, we opened up Vault Ultra Lounge in 2004, but maybe like 2006 or so, just, you know, one random night we were shorthanded behind the bar and I said, hey, fuck it, I'll go behind the bar. Yeah. I'll bartend, it can't be that hard. And, yeah. you know, I was just making simple drinks, shots, you know, rum and Cokes, you know, simple things like that. If I didn't know how to make it, I'd be I'd make it up on the spot, or I tell him to go see the next bartender. I sight, <laughs> you know, I or I would make something and be like, "Wow, it tastes funny." Well, that's how we make it here. So that's funny. You put his eye on <laughs> just, the spot. Just on the spot. It tastes funny. You know, it's funny that you say that because I didn't want to be a bartender. I actually shout out to Sam Ramirez who owns Continental. He owns Cardiff and Campbell. I he owned a restaurant. It was called Slice. If you really really know me, that's my nickname from back in the day. It was a pizza place called Slice that didn't serve slices, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> and and um, maybe that's one of the reasons it closed, but it wound up closing down. And the boss, his name was Sam, he was like, hey, you're really good with people. He's like, why don't you come and bartend for me? And I was 21 at the time, maybe going on 22, around that age. Uh, and so he's like, why don't you come work for me? And I was like, I don't want to bartend. That's not what I want to do because originally I had my business before I started working for Sam. I had my I started my business when I was 18. I only worked for Sam because it was a small establishment mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn what are big businesses do with their money. I have no business background. My family doesn't have a big business background. So I just figured like, let me just work for a small organization and see what they're doing. So I didn't want to keep working in restaurants and keep working in bars. I just wanted to learn business and then just go back into business. But he was like, bro, you need to try this bartender thing. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll check it out. And, and I, I fell in love with it. You know, I worked Cardiff at the time when I worked there. It was the only dance club in Campbell, California that really had a dance floor. Yeah. It was just lined around the corner all the time. And we would make like 400, 500 bucks a night. And this was when rent was way cheaper in the Bay Area. It was a different time. A lot more people would go out. The vibe was a lot different around town. So, and I, I even, I stopped doing my business and I just started bartending. I never really drank before I started bartending. Shout out to Sam. And then I really started drinking and I really got caught up in the nightlife, but I got addicted to that. To, you know, you make, you, I was working Wednesday making 400 bucks. I would work Friday or Saturday with 400 bucks. So cash. I was cash, yeah, like untaxed cash. And I would get a paycheck, the small one, bartender paychecks are weak, but I would get a paycheck also. So I was able to work one week, pay my rent, and then the rest was just like, you know, extra money. And I wasn't, I just stopped caring about business and finances. I just partied my ass off. But that's how I got into it. It was a super fluke, you know? So you were saying that you, you would, pour up drinks at, at vault how did that turn into you becoming a bartender would you do this regularly or because i know you were like what were you either manager or i was a general manager when we were at vault but, okay um we'll get back to that so actually i want to kind of start off i wrote a few notes wrote a few questions okay and um like i said well you kind of asked me first but my first question to you was going to be how did you get started in the nightlife you kind of elaborated on it but i wanted to get um uh, a little timeline going as well. So, what year was this when you started? Really, it was like I think we 2008. Figured, yeah, 2009. I started. I started bartending in, in 2008. I met Sam Ramirez probably 2007, 
It's either it's like you can give or take a year. Like yeah. it's, it's either 2007. It's it's definitely not six, but it's either 2007, 2008 when I met Sam, and then it's uh, 2009 uh, when I was really bartending. Yeah, because I remember that's pretty much when we first met when uh, when Slice was still open. I remember I'd pop in there every once in a while. Yeah. Um, I was working for uh, I was still doing the vault at the time here in downtown San Jose. But then I was also, my daytime job at the time was uh, Wells Fargo. So I was working at the Wells Fargo at the uh, Prune Yard in Campbell. I didn't know that's the one you worked at. For yeah, some reason, yeah. I always thought you worked downtown. No, I was at that Wells Fargo at the Prune Yard. And I remember I'd come by every once in a while to slice uh, for lunch. And, you know, we'd see JD. I'd hang out at Cardiff a lot uh, Thursday nights. I'd play uh, DJ there every once in a while Thursday nights. Uh, back when uh, Bobby De La Cruz, uh, shout out to Bobby De La Cruz, he shout was the promoter Bobby. for uh, Thursday nights for uh, Foxy, all house music on Thursdays. Forgot about Foxy. Yeah, yeah bring back like memories <laughs> right now, bro. <laughs> bring things that have been hidden for a long time now. And so uh, I remember like Thursday nights, you would be uh, bar backing, not bartending. Yeah. And um, you know, I'd play there, you know, twice a year or something. Myself and my brother Francisco, DJ FM. Shout out to my brother Francisco. Shout out to our brother Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, we would do Thursday nights over there every once in a while, but I mean, we'd also hang out there a lot, you know, because it was the hang out, like, I don't know, like, even the, even the Wednesday nights too, the Wednesday yeah. the hip hop night was, that was the only night they did hip hop there at Cardiff. That place in its heyday was cracking on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays would even be hit or Sundays, miss, yeah, and even yeah. some Sundays, it was Sundays were kind of hit or miss. And and I did a, a party on Mondays. Mondays wasn't like wall to wall, uh, Pat. But there is some crazy stuff. Some of the craziest nightlife memories I have happened at Cardiff on a Monday uh, night. So yeah, I'm not gonna really get into that. I will tell you the reason it was so crazy is there's no security guards <laughs> and there's no camera system. Right. It was a 20. Two 23 year old with a bar all to himself. I would just invite my friends, and you can only imagine. Well, imagine if someone just gave you a bar that it's you could just shenanigans. A lot of but, shenanigans. Yeah. But um, what are what are uh, some other questions? Uh, well, well, you already mentioned uh, Sam, so I wanted to know who were you know some of your early uh, mentors and uh, influencers, you know, in this you know in this business. Really, it was. It was Sam. It was Sam Ramirez. Like, I can't, I can't hone in the fact. There was a point where me and Sam got very close. Like Sam, Sam was. I'll never call another man my father, but my dad's not in my life. And everyone called Sam my stepdad. Sam gave me a car. Sam gave. Sam really was my only influence in the nightclub industry. He's the one who introduced me. He's the one who, till this day. Me, I work at Avery Lounge. If it was not for Sam and my hard work, my buddy gets mad when I say that, but if it wasn't for a mix of Sam and me working hard and, you know, not fucking stealing and stuff like that, but just putting in work, Sam introduced me to a lot of people. I've had maybe four bartending jobs over the course of the last 10 years. I haven't filled out any applications. I've just always been like, oh, you worked at Cardiff? I seen you work, you got the job. It literally- Yeah, it's just been handy. I mean, in the same way for me, like, a lot of our jobs have been handed to us because we have that reputation of hard workers. We never fucked anyone over. We yeah. never, you know, called in sick and but you know, when it was went to go went to go party somewhere else or bartend or work for somewhere else. You know, we're hard workers and you know, we handle business. Yeah. We handle business. And for years what? and years and years. You know what I mean? People like you could call us ugly. I don't I know if you're <laughs> they on call the podcast, you ugly, I don't know. But but we we have because nowadays back in the day bartending was historically it was a mix of guys and girls but there's still a lot more guy bartenders. I would say in 2019 one of the major changes and this might be a you know a leading question but one of the major changes that you see is there women are, are are dominating the bartending field. They just want fake tits. Excuse my language. They want you know no, fake you breasts. Whatever. I don't know what the hell to say. But. They want just pretty girls behind that bar. Pretty girls are way more lucrative. Girls like girls, guys like girls. They're still like, I think that us, Joe and I bring a cool element to the bar because girls still want to talk to a guy. Girls still want to see a guy. Girls still like to flirt and stuff like that. But, you know, the reason we've been able to stand the test of time is through hard work. You know, um, one of Joe's cousins just flew around. Um, <laughs> a little fruit fly or something. Um, but that's how we've been able to do it is through hard work. So... But yeah, I think I think if it was today, I don't think that me and Joe would have been able to bartend. 
to be honest. I think it would have like been way different. Yeah, it'd definitely be um, harder to you know break into the business. You know, these days, um, yeah, people. You know, all the time we get guys. You know, cool. You know, cool people. You know, they got the look, good-looking kids, whatever. Want to know how they can get behind the bar with us, and it's just like it's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. Like I'm sorry. You know, you can know all the people in the world. You can have all the followers and stuff like that. It's just um, it's, yeah, it's not. You, you got to put in the work, and people just want to go straight to the top. People don't want to put in the work these days, and I know that's um, something that's definitely changed over the years. And yeah, I, I, we can even we can even go off on a tangent because. I see that a lot. I see it even with myself. Anytime I'm about to compare or talk about somebody else, I see that with myself. But even, even I'm going off on a tangent, but even today, like, like I always look at my friends and my friends, like one of my buddies was like, oh, I'm going to take you out. Like, I'm going to be the top dog. I'm going to be number one. And it's like, that fool don't even show up on time. I'm like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what do you mean you're going to take? Like, I wish you could, you know, because it, it's going to push me, but yeah, work ethic is huge. Work ethic is huge, and if there, like, I'm not gonna sit here and say like a dude can't bartend. I know plenty of guy bartenders, and the thing about bartending is it's a high turnover field. Yes. So is. if you keep putting in an application and they can't find someone, that could be your foot in the door. That's pretty much how I became a bartender at Avery and how Joe became because. Uh, shout out to Carl eating us at Avery, <laughs> but it was a blessing in disguise because and taking it, all of uh, most of Avery's staff yeah, with a, him when he left. Yeah, he did. Um, <laughs> I don't know his intentions. I personally, you know, have, um, unbiased. I actually like Carlos still. Uh, yeah, Carlos but, is cool. You guys gotta check out his new spot uh, in downtown, uh, Social Lady. It's a nice, a nice little yeah, spot nice on venue. San Fernando Street. He also has what's his other spot? Uh, Third and Bourbon. Third and Bourbon. Oh man, the food's bomb. I yeah. love the sliders over there. He has a peanut butter and jelly sliders fire. <laughs> so Carlos is cool, but but by he found a better opportunity and he left abruptly, and it opened the door for me to become the bar manager, Joe's pretty much assistant manager, and a bartender there. And if, you know, me and him, if one of us always has to be there, but you can get in by finding those loops and always keeping yourself in the game. Or like me, I was fortunate, but I was able to, like when I started at Cardiff, how I got my foot in the door was I, I told him, like, I, I, like, let me just get the wackest nights. So when I first started bartending at Cardiff, I think I worked on Wednesday and Monday and Sundays. And we were able to, on Monday, I was able to, I just hired one of my buddies, shout out to Chip, to DJ for me. And I was like, I'll just give you, you know, whatever, like, I'll give you part of my tips. And if you hit a certain sales number, they'll pay you out of the register. And he was like, cool. And he started Monday Night Retox. But we were able, I was able to make, because I was the only person in there, I was making anywhere from 100 to 200 bucks for four hours of work, which at the time was cool, plus a paycheck. And then, but there'd be nights I made three, four hundred bucks. There'd be nights where I made 20, 30 bucks. But, you know, I averaged between 100 and 200 bucks on a Monday. Then Wednesdays, you know, we started a party, which is how I met Nappy and Golden Child. So on Wednesdays, we would, um, we started Rubber Soul. Yeah. And Joe can tell you, it was the greatest party in Campbell and even in San Jose. It was like, it was so good of a party that it was like, you know when you buy it, like, we don't do this as much anymore, but like my old heads will know what I'm talking about. When you buy like a dope pair of shoes or a dope jacket, people ask where you got it from, you don't tell them. You know what I mean? You don't tell your secret because you don't want to, you don't want to exploit it or you don't want to like devalue it. So part of it was, I was just talking about this, like it, the party was so dope, like you would bring your friends and literally be like, don't tell nobody, let's not ruin this because it was just such a good vibe on Wednesdays. But I was able to win and get my foot in the door by taking on uh, taking on the worst nights, but then we converted some of the worst nights into some of the best nights. There was a point where the sales of Wednesday night were better than a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday at Cardiff. Yeah. Facts. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. Yep, I remember those Wednesday nights, and, you know, it was just the music, the vibe, everything, the people. It was all good, and people would always have... Uh, how would I say, a bad uh, image of a hip-hop party, you know, yeah. in the South Bay. That's always going to die. Yeah, and I would always tell people, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, you know, it's going to be a bunch of gang members, a bunch of ghetto hood motherfuckers, stuff like that. And no, it would be good vibes, everyone having a great time, people dancing, enjoying the music, 
letting the DJs do their thing. Not like today where everyone's, every other person is walking up with their cell phone, shoving it in a fucking DJ's face, trying to request a song. Oh, I fucking hate that shit. I want to punch a bitch when I see that. Like, seriously, I mean, I can't stand that stuff. I mean, they are DJs for a reason. They're getting paid to do their job, you know? Yeah. No one's uh, walking in the back of the kitchen at McDonald's telling, you know, telling you how to fucking flip that uh, Big Mac and all that bullshit, you know? I'll walk back there. <laughs> no, I feel you. I'm not a DJ, so I'm not, I don't have any, not saying I don't, I just don't know that experience. I don't know what it'd be like. Because, you know, from the outside looking in, you see a DJ and it's like, I think instinctually, I don't know where it came from. But you, we just think that DJs take requests. No, and, and they don't. They don't. Yeah. Just, they don't. They shouldn't have to. They're getting yeah. paid to do a job just like, you know, any other job. Like I said, and, you know, they're there. They're professionals. Let them do their thing. So, so, um, go ahead. Do you have any, what other Yeah, other okay. Topics? Well, I got an, uh, a few a few more questions I had uh, jotted down because I already knew we were going to kind of spin off once we uh, <laughs> asked the talking. question. Yes, sir. And so, well, one of my questions um, that I have for you is, uh, how have uh, how's the game changed? How's the nightlife industry changed from when you started to it is now? Like, especially, well, obviously, one of the big uh, game changers is uh, social media. I mean, oh, social yeah. media has been. I wouldn't even thought of that. Pretty much um, over like the past ten years. Now, really, I mean, we've been we've been using social media for a while, but not as crazy as we are. So pretty much since two thousand nine, two thousand ten till now i mean obviously now everyone you know is on one or two you know or every any platform they can think of but i know when we got started say you know just for example when i got started at the vault um myspace was uh, was like one of the big social medias at the time so we were all over myspace you know the waitresses the bartenders we you know every nightclub and bar had their own myspace page and stuff like that that's this crazy is, you know this is 2004 when we were doing that but um but like I said, from like when you started out 2009, 2010, how have things like evolved over the years? I think that parties were built with patience. Um, I, you know, the first thing, I'll tell you the first thing that came to my mind when you said what has changed. I will tell you what has changed. Girls are way more ratchet. <laughs> I would say the ratchet level of females in the nightclub is at an all time high. I just think, I think it, everything has flipped so back in the day i think that when a girl would come in so it's, you know girls never come alone i do have a rule about that i will tell you a side note most girls who go to the clubs by themselves are crazy but that's <laughs> I, that's just an observation i've been doing this 10 years and i met a lot of i've met a lot of crazy girls who are by themselves um but i just feel like back in the day like you had a group say of like five girls you know, pretty much them, who can all fit in one car. They'll travel in yeah, one car. Yeah, yeah. So They'll fill yeah. up the car. We'll say a car full of girls. And three of them would be, you know, pretty conservative. Your nine to fivers. Like, yeah, they obviously girls have girls' thoughts. But they would just dress like cool, you know, a cool little swag to them. And there would be like, you know, it's always that one big girl. And then <laughs> you would have that one girl who just dressed hella provocatively, right? Hella provocatively. Like, show it all. And that was almost... That was almost like normal, like, okay, and then that girl, you just kind of label like, okay, she's a freak of the group, mm -hmm. and then the other ones would really be the freaky ones, but you couldn't tell because they're dressed normal. Today, and I don't know if it's just Avery Lounge, nah, it's all clubs. Girls, it's all clubs. Girls show everything now. I just feel like there's nothing left to the imagination. I feel like, and it's not a bad thing. I don't mind girls wearing what they're wearing, but girls are wearing lingerie where you can literally see, like, their nipples. You know, or you can literally like butt cheeks hanging out. Like not all girls. And I'm not shaming this. If you want to do that, it's your body. If you want to go out like that, it's your body. This is, you know, God's green earth. I don't care what you do with your body. We're just talking about the changes that I've seen. I just feel like girls are way more provocative. I definitely, back to social media, I blame it on social media desensitizing us to where we've seen everything now. Between like internet porn and <laughs> social media, we've seen... We've seen everything. We we like there's not like you girls just what can they compete with at this point? Yeah, there's like, uh, celebrity sex tapes and you yeah, know, look at Kim K. Dick pics, you know, of fucking basketball players or whatever, whatever it is, you know. I mean, all of it is just out there. All of it's on the internet for everyone to see. There's uh, nothing's private anymore these days. Nothing is uh, sacred. Yeah, so I feel know? like things were sacred back in the day. I feel like 
everything was a little more and I don't mind social media I don't mind where we're going so that's one change the next change I had a uh, What's one what's one major change besides social media that you've seen while my next thought comes to my head? Huh. Well, well, a lot of it with the social media, you know, part or aspect of it is um, everyone in the industry, in the nightlife industry now has become a promoter. Yes, that you is know, true. from you know, from the waitresses to the barbacks to the bartenders, you know, everyone. Um, everyone does their part now or you know some people do it a little more than others and all yeah. that but it's you know very Everybody important that promoter. everyone has to do their part and it takes the whole team for all of us to succeed you that know um, and you know so you know like I like it you know other days I hate it some days you know I don't I don't even want to be on social media I don't even want to look at my fucking phone sometimes yeah. I just I'll throw it at the end of the bed and I won't pick it up for hours or even look at it. I'll leave it charging in my bedroom. And I'm going to go out to the living room and watch some TV or something, you know, just to clear my sure. mind to get away from it. But um, but it's just something, it's just part of the business now. It's just the nature so of the business. We have to add, you know, value to our business. And one way to add value is social media yeah. to post, to remind people you know what you're doing where you're at like you know i bartend at two different spots i'm at you know avery and i'm also at uh, san patricio's which is on uh, san fernando street here downtown san, san Jose. patricio's you know shout out to it's my a beautiful guys. spot uh, if you look you on know, my page you'll see some pictures <laughs> yes sir i think another go ahead finish um your what was i saying so yeah i mean i like to let people know where i'm at every single night you know even though like i say i'm still promoting avery on nights that i'm not there People all the time will hit me up like, oh, hey, what's going on tonight? Are you at Avery tonight? You got San Patricio's? Or what are you up to? I always like to let people know what I'm doing, uh, to know where I'm at. Or even if I'm not doing anything at all, like I recommend places like, oh, go over here. You know, my brother's DJing over here or one of the other homies is in town or whatever. Like we're going to be hanging out at Cardiff or we're going to be hanging out at Continental. You know, things like that. So I always like to, you know... Promote what I'm doing, promote what some of my friends are doing, uh, things like that. And the easiest way to do that is social media because everyone is on these things all day long, 24-7. It's in their hand or it's right next to them. Yeah, it's huge. Even if, you know, I think even my whole movement, it, that's why it's, it's social media because I look at my girl and like me and my girl will be laying next to each other. And I used to be hella anti-social media, like literally six months ago a year ago like i was hella and i just i just kind of looked down and and i just see everyone on their phones and i was like i'm just gonna take advantage of this i'm just gonna put out content long story short um social media is huge i take advantage of it that's why at this time you know i'm getting ready to put a, uh this is for ipod uh a podcast is gonna be on itunes i'm doing an instagram live and i'm doing i'm recording it so i can put it on youtube all social media platforms because who he who has the attention has the money and and so it, social media yes is important back to the question of another thing that has changed i feel like in the hip-hop industry i can't talk for any other type of industry because i've only worked in <clears throat> predominantly either house or hip-hop clubs and <clears throat> excuse me i don't think that i don't think that in hip-hop i don't think people dance anymore I feel like when hip hop was started, hip hop, if you watch any Netflix documentary, hip hop comes from disco. Disco was a heavy dance. Uh, it was where kids would go to escape and it was, it's been, he, dance was huge. You know, obviously there's like the battle rap and things like that. But if you go, we'll, we'll go say, if you went to a hip hop club 10 years ago, you know, people are going to be on the dance floor. They're going to be sweaty. They're going to be dancing. It was, you know, it was almost like a backyard barbecue. You could really kind of dance with anyone. Girls were a little bit bougie, but really like you could still, you could still, people were still interacting with each other. Yeah, there was no cell phones. There was like, you, or it was just in your pocket for phone calls. Yeah, you and, weren't uh, going live and trying to stun. Yeah, and... there was no Snapchat. You're not like, you're not pulling your phone out for Snapchat. Like you're literally just dancing. And I feel like if you fast forward to that same hip hop club, like today, it's all about bottle service. It's all about looking cool. It's all about the chains. It's all about the fake boobs. It's all about the big butts. It's all about showing everything. And just, I feel like we do it for social media. Like I feel like people dress up just to put it on social media at this point. And it's not as dance heavy. I'm not saying people don't dance, but there's, if you go to like, for example, I just went to LA. 
when you go to LA or San Francisco, like I don't feel like it's hit as hard, but you go to these major clubs, Miami's already been like this for years. People ain't dancing. They're dancing a little bit. The girls are kind of dancing with each other, but there's not even a dance floor no more. The clubs just have only bottle section stations. It's just literally like, I went to a club and it may be like, just imagine a, a, a square. And then in each square, there's just like bottle section, bottle section, bottle section. So they like three, three, two DJ booth. Yeah. Literally, there's no dance floor. There's nowhere for you mm -hmm. to dance. It's just lay aisles to get to bottle service. Yeah, you kind of, you know, forced to just party at your table, which a lot of people do like to do, but. But it's no if dance I wanna, floor. If I want to dance, no, yeah, I want to hit the dance floor. If I, when I go to the club, like on an off night, I want to dance. That's usually what I want to do. I mean, yeah, old. I get. Because, yeah, because we're old. I still love dancing, and it's hard to get someone to dance with. People are like, ah, I don't want to dance, so they can dance for one or two songs. I mean, you know, back in our day, like when we go out, say, a Thursday Wednesday, night, or yeah. even on a Wednesday night, you know, at Cardiff, and we danced the whole night. We The only time we'd stop dancing, go get another drink at the bar, take our drink back to the dance floor, continue dancing. We danced yeah. the night away. Literally, DJs would have to play whack music. So people would go drink. It's like a thing. That's a nightclub <laughs> secret. If you just hear a hell of whack song, it's normally the the club owner saying, "Hey, play something whack," and so that people can go grab a cocktail, and then they'll turn the energy right back up, and it will get crazy again. But I just feel like the club industry is going towards not dancing. I think that's one of the another huge difference I notice in the dance in the in the club industry is it's all like a fashion show stunt with bottle service. Which is nothing wrong with that, but it's just not my... Well, people want to, you know, live their best life and, yeah. uh, you know, show it off on, you know, on social media is what it is. So that's funny because that kind of led into my next question is, um, you know, you kind of answered it already, but I'm still going to ask it anyways because you might have another thing or two. Um, I wanted to know what were your likes and dislikes about uh, this industry? Yeah. Well, I know that's, you know, like I said, that's kind of one of them, but I mean, I mean, there oh, could just be any, anything in general, you know, likes My and dislikes. likes and dislikes about the nightlife industry. I'll say what I, what I still like and what keeps me there is it gives me an opportunity to still be in nightlife because I am getting older and I would not go out every weekend. And it gives me an opportunity, like, I would say that out of the people who have joined live, Three of them I met in the nightlife industry. So I love that it's a huge networking capability. Like I know mm -hmm. you from nightlife. Yes. I know, you know, this office was provided because I worked in the industry. I know uh, my buddy Sid just joined on Instagram Live. Shout out, what's up? I met her from uh, Chacho's, which is another spot I worked at. So I love the networking. I love that you were around people. I'm very social. I love that, you know, we're hanging out with our coworkers. We're hanging out with guests. You really get to know people. Avery Lounge, it's so loud that it's hard to really meet people and network. But I felt like like uh, Chacho's, I met hell of people there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, shout I out met. to uh, George Sanchez. Yeah, uh, George. Chacho's restaurant George here is in a good uh, downtown San Jose. Shout out to Jocho's. Shout out to George. So I, I love that element. I love the networking. I love just getting to know people. I think um, that's a major like. Another like that I like, I like the money. I love the, you know, I love the pace of it. I like that you can get in. Like, I'm, we're going to show up tonight. We're going to get in there at 9. I'm going to be out of there about 2.30, 2.45. God willing, I'm going to have some money in my pocket. And, you know, in, in, a, in two weeks, I'm going to get a check. I like the money. I like that there's beautiful people around me, uh, guys and girls. I love that people get dressed up and they, they, it's, I feel like the reason I still work in the nightlife, even though I'm, you know, always on like a positive kick, I feel like people need it. I feel like everyone works nine to five. When I go, I have a nine to five now and now I understand it. Like they force you guys to be professional. Professional is another word for robotic mm -hmm. and you need a place to fucking let go yes you need unwind, a place to yeah. just dance and drink and fucking shout and hey girl and you people need that and it's a healthy outlet and with the good Avery Lounge is Nappy does a really good job he has security he wants it's a beautiful establishment so you can go there feel safe like yeah obviously something can always happen but we provide as safe as an environment for people to just have a good time you could come dressed and nothing and, and not have to worry about a dude just grabbing you up or something like yeah, we'll remove yeah. that guy. So I feel like 
nightlife is just such a good expression of of who we are as people just get out and let go i love the just seeing you know all the different fashions i love seeing how you know we're i'm, I'm 33 now but i love seeing like the young kids with their chains and their gold teeth and <laughs> you know what i mean like thinking their shit don't stink and i just like remember like damn that was me 10 years ago you know i thought i was the coolest kid ever so I really like that. I think literally the only thing I don't like is that you you really, I feel like I haven't sacrificed because I, you know, I'm compensated for it. But you, you, the main thing I do not like is that it takes a huge part of your life away. Literally tonight, I'm not going to be able to hang out with any of my friends because I have to go to work. You know, I take advantage of like Saturday days and Sunday days to do things I love like this podcast and stuff. But I can't just dip out. I can't just, you know what I mean? I'm always kind of on a leash. Uh, and that's probably the biggest thing that, that I don't like about it. And the last thing is that it has such a negative connotation. Like if my girl says, oh, like, oh he's a bartender, or you tell people like, people just, it's like almost like a, a negative association. I know people who make less, but rather make less because of the image of bartending. You know, um, so it definitely doesn't have the best image all the time. Yes, a lot of people think that, you know, everyone in the nightlife industry is a bunch of, you know, hookers and hoes, you know, you know, to pretty much put it out there like that. I am neither a hooker nor ho. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, so, you know, right back at you, what are some of your likes and what are some of your dislikes? Um, again, you kind of mentioned a few things. I like being social. I like being, you know, out and about and, you know, I'm just very active, um, when the sun is down, you know, it's those vampire hours, just agree with me. Um, vampire life, vampire life. Yes, sir. And like, I, like, you know, I always would say, I, I still like it more than I hate it. That's why I continue to do this. And it's a great way to make money. It's a great way to make, uh, to meet people. I've met a lot of great people. A lot of great people. A lot of great Shout people. Shout out to all of y'all. You know, doing uh, this nightlife thing. I've been doing this going on 20 plus years. I started, uh, you know, when I was still in high school, 16 years old, when I started working at my first nightclub. And, you know, shout out to uh, Mauricio Mejia. You know, he gave me the opportunity. And, you know, I kind of made the opportunity uh, for myself as well, though, because I started out passing out flyers just to get into the club for free. And, you know, after a few months, that just wasn't enough for me anymore. And I put myself out there, like, what else can I do for you? What can I do? And Mauricio was like, hey, I sit in the office, you know, here at the nightclub, you know, I do accounting, I, you know, push paper, do all this other stuff, come in and just see what I do and we'll go from there. I can find some work for you. And that's literally what I did after school every single day, Monday through Friday. It was just two to three hours after school every day. But that's why I learned a lot in this business, seeing the behind the scenes stuff from ordering the liquor to, you know, paying your security to... You know, the janitor that comes in and keeps our club clean. I mean, every... Shout out to the janitors that keep <laughs> clubs clean. That shit is no joke. Because you guys are some dirty motherfuckers dirty. that come to the club once you guys in a while. Are Girls are the nastiest. I thought dudes would be the nastiest girls, bro. What are you guys doing in the girls' bathroom? It's disgusting. Um, Go, I, I just side <laughs> But, I mean... Clean up your act. Um, a lot of that, like I said, I got to see the behind-the-scenes um, look at a very young age and I got to learn the value of, you know, a dollar, what it costs to run the place from, how much our lease was every single month, how much we were spending on alcohol, how much we were making on alcohol. And so that's why I've always been a stickler about, you know, bartenders, waitresses, whoever, people giving away stuff or wanting free stuff and this and that. I mean, yes, it's part of the business again. I remember we touched on this a little bit the last time, but everything costs money in that club and everything it's not red bulls everything it's not my stuff to give away and so uh, like i said i started out pretty much in management in the nightclub so i got to learn that at a very young age so by the time i was 22 years old in 2004 when we opened up uh vault ultra lounge i was given the general manager position there and you know, Mauricio's other partners were like, hey, like this young guy's gonna come in and, you know, you did a really be, good job. Be, you know, our manager. And Mauricio's like, hey, you know, you'll see. And, you know, we ran that place great. And I was very mature for my age because I started out at a young age and got. Not, to let me pause there. He's not mature for any other reason. <laughs> this fool had a beard at 12. Continue. This fool, if you're, you're listening to this, look for it on YouTube. This fool has the craziest beard I've ever seen. No, it's all right. It's all right. But, um, 
So yes, so again, that's just a little bit of background on me. Um, some of the things that I do dislike is, yes, not being, say, home with my kids on the weekends, you know, be able to just hang out and watch a movie or play some video games. So yes, it uh, does take away some time from the family, some time from your loved ones. You know, it's been, it's hard to have a relationship when you're in this business. Very hard. You know, you got to find someone who's solid, who's not going to be jealous about it. I mean, you know, the, those things are always going to be there, the jealousy, all that stuff. But it's, uh, you know, it's hard to maintain a relationship because you're at the club every weekend. Your co-workers are, you know, all these beautiful women. Customers are a lot of beautiful women and stuff like that. And Some ugly ones, too. Oh, there's definitely a lot of ugly ones, too. Like it. <laughs> The ugly ones, or whatever. <laughs> no, we're not, right, not going to go there about the ugly ones. No. But um, yeah, I mean, we that. we we are around a lot of pretty people all the time, and so. But it's not how you think it is. It's like, not. It's definitely not how you I think it is. I will take a side note. Like we're around a lot of girls, and there a lot of them are really pretty. But a lot of them, like, it's so like like I like tonight. I'll give you a rundown. Tonight, it's I'm going to get there at nine. At 9.30, a cute chick's gonna show up who has a boyfriend. I'm not gonna hit on her. It's not like we're just gonna like, at 9.30, I'm gonna make sweet, passionate love to this girl. <laughs> you know, right. they start bartending and pour champagne on the crowd. Like, it's not like that. Like, she's gonna show up at 9.30, she's gonna crush it. We're gonna sell as many drinks as we can, provide the best atmosphere, whatever. And then, you know, customers are gonna come, beautiful girls come to the bar. Like, as crazy as it gets, it's like, they'll just start dancing. We have a thing, like, we'll just start like, hey, we'll start clapping or something. They'll get crazy, they'll drink their drinks, and I won't see them. Like, they'll come back and order a drink, and then it's last call, and I, like, they're gone in the wind. Like, that's it. If they're, you know, if you're single or something, you could reach out a little bit more and maybe make a little bit more happen. But a lot of times, like, a lot of these girls, they have dudes, or they, they are in a relationship, or they're just going home, or they're customers and you know it's not like when you're working it's not like you can just really hit on a chick it's you can like slide a number maybe but it's not as crazy as you would think it's not like but from the outside looking in it's like those memes like what ha really happens versus what people think happens yes. and it's like oh, the, the what really happens is like we show up we get we like pour drinks and then we just go home and like fall asleep and cry ourselves to sleep like, you know what <laughs> I mean it's not like that. it's not uh it's not as glamorous as you would think you could turn it into whatever you want though but yeah so that's just a side note i just think people think like it's like this crazy thing i know my girl thinks it's like this crazy thing i think i'm fortunate that my my fiance she works at night so, mm -hmm. and she, once she like really started having to pay bills and stuff, she definitely understood why I do it. And she just gives me a lot less shit about it. But when I was younger, oh my gosh, she's like, why do you do it? Or, you know, like, like if a girl, I would talk to a girl and she would know I'm like, oh, you're, I wouldn't even be hitting on girls. And like someone would tell me like, oh, your dude was hitting. I'm like, bro, I didn't yeah, hit on just, her. Like, just people will take being friendly as being flirty. Not yeah. just like, I'm just friendly with people. I mean, it's part of the job. I mean, we're in customer Dude, service. Punch a yeah. customer in the throat? Like, what am I supposed to yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, which I've done in the past. It's Joe is very violent, <laughs> side note. But, you know, like... Yes, people, it might look like it's something. No, I'm just being friendly to a customer, you know? They're like, oh, you were flirting with that girl at the bar. I was like, I was just being friendly. But, I mean, if you want to take this flirting, like, okay. Yeah, no. Whatever. I'm just, I'm just trying to get that extra money, that tip for myself and the rest of my team. You know, I want these people to have a good experience and come yeah, back to the bar really about. and spend money and take care of us. You know, we're all here to win, and I'm just trying to win. And that's part of winning, being friendly giving that good customer service, you know, maybe giving that one girl a little better service than say that other girl or whatever it you. is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, but no, I that's pretty much what that, that's, that's what it is. No, we, we, we show love to everybody. almost, almost everyone. You almost. Know? almost. <laughs> you get what you put out. I try to, I yes. try to be cool, but just remember you get what you put out. Don't come to the club acting like a dick and think you're going to get all-star service. Yeah. You know, we're people too. We have, we're normal, we're not freaking robots, like, show some respect. I'm very respectful out the gate, so I've always gotten a lot of love. Um, and even, I'm so nice at times that when people come at me crazy and I just kill them with nice, like, I've just got, like, nine times out of ten people are like, my bad, bro, like, I just had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Let me just get a vodka grand. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's uh, this last question that I'm seeing here? Oh, so, I know you can't read my writing, I write like a doctor, so, um... 
one of the things is um, since we started this or well since JD has started this I've been getting a lot of uh, people asking about you know the podcast yeah you know what what is our podcast about what are we doing I'm just letting everyone know you know this is JD's podcast we're just you know we're putting out content you know we're adding value we're showcasing you know some of our friends in the business um, I mean and not just the nightlife stuff you know it's going to be you know all across the board whether it's you know you were with uh, you did your podcast with Al J from uh, San Jose uh, Barbell and no, shout out to San Jose Barbell shout out to San Jose Barbell um, you know you had Jay Wells you had our guy you know Rory on here as well had Joe Sexual sitting right here <laughs> next to me Yes, sir. So, you know, a lot of people have already been hitting me up like, hey, how can I get on the podcast? And then I've already now in turn, I'm already at like thinking about it because, you know, JD had pointed it out is how is this going to add value? So I'm already thinking about how is this guest or this person who wants to be on the con- on the podcast going to add value to what we're doing? You know, some people just kind of want to come on and just talk shit and bullshit. And I'm like, that's not what we're doing. We're, you know, giving people a little bit of game, explaining some of the business to them. So uh, yeah. one of my questions, or my last question is, you know, how has this been adding value since we started? And then also, who are some maybe upcoming guests you would like to have on the podcast with you? Um, I will first start to say, like Joe said, that this is not his podcast. This podcast is for the people. Um, a lot of cool things have happened since I started the podcast, but this is everyone's podcast. Like, I don't... Like, whether you can, you know, I would hope that you could add value, and but I just think by telling your story, you're adding value, and every time you sit down to talk with someone, you're going to take gems from that. You're going to hear things that you haven't heard. Um, Joe's cousin keeps messing with <laughs> That fucking fruit fly. Um, <laughs> but, but to, like, to add value, this, this podcast adds value because it gives you, it shines light into other industries. You know, Jay Wells is a DJ. You get to see, you get to hear a DJ story and what he's been through and his struggles and what are his goals. You know, Al J is a, a personal trainer. You're gonna get to hear how is he. Al J is one of the strongest dudes in the world, in California and in the world. He can lift damn near four times his body weight, which is if you think about, let's like take bench pressing. If you weigh a hundred pounds, Al J can lift four hundred pounds at a hundred pounds. Like your little brother is a hundred pounds. Imagine your little brother lifting 400 pounds. That's Al J. So you get a peek into his mindset. You, you know, I have Joe here. Joe, he was just saying like between me and Joe, we got 25, 30 years in this in this industry. Yeah. Um. So now you get to hear like about okay, what is a bartender's life really like? What is is you know what is it like to be a bar manager you know what type of girls are going what happens with the girls like nothing you know what i'm saying but that's the thing is is like if this was 10 years later like i could make the most i could there is that all the stuff that you do think happens does happen but uh with bartending per se like you know co-workers definitely hook up and you know oh, yeah, customers and, and bartenders definitely have hooked up i've definitely hooked up with customers but i've changed like i said i have a fiance now so i don't get down like that i don't even get numbers i don't you know you're lucky if i exchange instagram with you because i don't want to put myself in a, a risky position so all that stuff does happen but this podcast add value to to so that you can see two things so you can see other people's life and I'm a nobody. My family is uh, is is from a foreign country. So I just like I want people to say like, man, if I want to start a podcast, I can start a podcast. If if I have guests on there because it's like I'm not special, but I'm showing people by example. I I sit here and say, hey, you can do whatever you want. If I'm not doing nothing, then what is that message? So by yeah. me doing this, it adds value. By me showing it online, even if no one's watching, even if 10 people see it, that's 10 people like, damn, that fool started a podcast. Joe's gonna have 10 people. Damn, that fool Joe is on a podcast. You know, it's gonna be on YouTube. People are gonna see like, damn, who's this fool? He started a podcast. It's not a big deal that I did this, but the values in leading from the front. I just want people to know that I didn't come from anything. I had no camera equipment. I had no laptop. I had nothing. I was just a kid who read a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I wanted to start a business. This is 10 years ago. And how the value has been added is that I turned my whole life around. I have a, I have a business, I have real customers, and I just want to speak on that. And so instead of me taking the profits and just either being selfish with it or 
just fully putting it back into my business. I wanted to start an information business. I wanted to give people information on how to be successful. And that's what started the podcast. And I don't want to say that the conversation between me and Joe is practice, but I'm getting so Joe can tell you and I from it is practice. Everything you do is practice. Every time you do something, you're getting better. I don't treat it as if it's practice, but I'm now learning a system from Joe. So this is a question like, you've seen the first time, Joe was there the first time I ever set up my podcast. It was in this room, it was with this guy. Like, I was guessing, how long did it take? It took us, you know, almost an hour and a half to set up. How long did it take me this time? To, like, 20 minutes, you know, if that. You know, if we that. Said we, we set up quick. Um, Seven minutes. It probably took as long, <laughs> like, us bullshitting. Well, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, because we were kind of bullshitting a little bit as we were setting up. So that's why we were I mean, talking we, about 21 Savage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were. About the 21 Savage memes, yeah. about him being that British. That shit's I didn't uh, know he was British. All the memes <laughs> make sense. Um, um, but... Yeah, you've already done a few in between, you know, our first podcast and our second podcast. And just getting those reps in is going to make us sound better. We're going to be more polished. It's, um, you know, we're are getting our shit together. And like I said, once you get those reps in, it's just like anything. From bartending, we tell people, like, oh, how do you learn how to bartend? And it take long to get to learn all those drinks. And I tell people, like, I'm still learning till this day. I learn something new all the time. That's why you're winning, Joe. Behind the bar. And you got to have that mindset, too. You got to have that mindset. Just keep putting the reps in. Keep showing up, you know. Keep, you know, like today, we were supposed to start at 5. We started at 5.30, you know. As it was, we're still here Shout doing to my it. fiance. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, but we're still here. We're doing it. We said we we're going to do it. And we're here. We showed up, and we're doing it. And that's, you know, one of the main things. Just... Showing up, you're already, you're winning already. So that, therein lies the value. It's in those reps. And it actually, I'm going to lead into the next, you know, you asked pretty much two questions. What type of, what guests would I have? And, and so you have to think when, when by me doing all these and me doing podcasts, I don't want to, I, we are, I'm a regular person. Joe is a regular person. It's not like we're fucking Elon Musk or something like that. Like this fool doesn't own no Fortune 500 company. So in that sense, we are regular. Everyone has genius in them. Joe has genius. You have genius. Everyone has genius in them. So I feel like I try to unlock everyone's genius. But we are regular people, and and but I'm practicing on this platform because I am in, not even instinctually, but just in my heart, I want to be prepared for bigger and better opportunities. I would love for one day. I just think about like I would love for like like and you don't know what piece of information is going to completely change your life coca-cola could call me tomorrow and be like hey we want to sponsor your podcast yeah and if i'm not prepared and i don't have a product and i can't set up a camera and i can't talk to a guest how the hell is coca-cola going to call me you know so what it is by adding by preparing for blessings i'm much more likely to be blessed who's i i I don't compare myself to anyone else i talk about version a of myself and version b it just instinctually who has a better chance of succeeding? The guy who does podcasts with his friends, sets up, tries to do them one or two every week, is putting them on iTunes, putting them up on YouTube, or the version of me that's just like, damn, I'm going to just sit at home and sleep, and I just hope Coca-Cola gives me my own podcast. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like, I may not get a, a Coca-Cola sponsorship at all. Who knows what's going to happen from this? But what's more likely to happen? So that's where the the value is is me putting in those reps and showing you that you need to put in those reps to make your dreams talk about it rory talked about it shout out to rory you know focus on the now focus on right now focus on today me and joe got in here we set up we're doing we're actually doing it but that leads into i want to be prepared when i start going after the guest that i want to really interview some of the guests that i really want to interview on you know more of a bay area level is i really like um um, like Ari's movement, yeah. You yeah. know, I want to get Ari on the podcast. I feel like she's really into social media. Um, on you know, locally, I want to get um, Build a Beast. Yeah, Sean. Uh, I want to yeah, get Sean, Sean on, here. on here. Shout out to Sean. Shout out to Sean. I definitely want to get Sean on here. Um, some people from Sean's crew, I want to get on here. I want to get uh, like Shabazz. He's a big DJ. Yeah, I would yeah. love to talk to Shabazz from San Francisco. You know, and then just really like. I like like Filthy Rich. I like you know Bay Area rappers like Keep the Sneak. I would love to have like the top ten like you know Too Short, 
Um, I also people's brains. Like Mr. Fab. Mr. Fab, Fab. I would love to have Mr. Dude. Fab. You know, he just the... started his podcast too, and I, I was like catching some of it the other day, man. Thanks. That dude's doing things, man. I love yeah. that dude. Yeah, shout out to Mr. Fab. I really like his movement. So I would love to get like Mr. Fab. I would love like E40. I, just all the top like Bay Area rappers I would love to have on here. Mm -hmm. Because Bay Area music has been, it actually launched my career in fashion. So if you don't know, I make clothes, I produce clothes. But when Matt Dre, I started my business when Matt Dre died. And the first thing I ever sold was a Matt Dre t-shirt. Matt Dre, you know, I was able to turn, you know, a four to ten dollar shirt into a twenty to twenty-five dollar shirt. And you know I'm you know R.I.P. Mac Dre. Shout out to his family. Like I that was horrible, but that's what launched my business. And so through that I was listening to Mr. Fab and I was part of the hyphy movement and I went dumb and mm -hmm. you know leading into and I listened to E40 and so I would like to interview those like like that on a local level like as far as artists and then like anybody like, I love business so. You know, I would love to have like Larry and Paige from Google. I would love to have my, Mark Zuckerberg. I would love to have Elon Musk. I would love to have, um, you know, these guys who are huge that I listen to. I would love to internet. Like my number one, if I could, if I could, uh, my my life's gonna end in a minute. But the one person, if I could interview anyone, it would be Eric Thomas. Eric Thomas is a motivational speaker. Uh, he would be my number one choice to interview. Um, and because he had such a huge impact, he's just someone who like told me no excuses. Mm -hmm. He's someone that like, like I'm going to go hard. Yes, sir. Like, I don't care what you do. I don't care what Joe does. I don't care what my bosses do. I don't care what people think I should do. I'm going to go hard because I want to change my family. I'm going to go 120. I'm going to, I woke up the other day at four in the morning. I cut, I'm trying to cut back as many negative habits as I possibly can because I look at the bigger picture. So those are some of the people that, that I would want to interview. And that's how I add value is by just showing people that they can do it. So I, you know, for, and you know, kind of leading to you, what, what, what do you think is valuable from the outside looking in? And if you, you know, I think Joe should take advantage of some of this stuff. And, you know, I might get one more mic so that we could, me and you could bring in guests together um, and just have like a spinoff segment. But, you know, who would you like to? And, you know, how can, how has this podcast added value to your life? Um, well, it's adding value by creating content, showing, you know, others that we do more than just a bartend or make shirts and our nine to fives or whatever. We are out here just doing things and making moves, making moves, trying to add value. And we want to be around other people that are making bigger moves than us. And we not just, you know, the staffing uh, company, not just the real estate deals and stuff like that. We're out here doing things, trying to make moves, trying to, you know, just blow up, Yeah, <laughs> you know, have investments, have money, working for us instead of us working for the money yeah that's uh just a side note like i this podcast is a, is you know my main goal is just to convert the income that i'm making into you know passive income income that works for me so by putting out all of this stuff while i'm asleep you can still watch the facebook live or the instagram live you can still yes, listen to the podcast it's you can still watch the youtube video so a lot of stuff i do is just so that you know, I can add value even when I'm sleeping, you know. So what, what, uh, kind of finish up, we're coming, coming on an hour. I always want to do about an hour, but I'll ask, you know, who would be, you know, maybe one or two of your dream guests? Dream guests, man. Joe Rogan. Yeah, I can you know, definitely I, mean, I love, that. I listen to uh, Joe Rogan's podcast all the time. You know, I've met him a handful of times, you know, he makes his way into San Jose a lot. Um, you know, one of the biggest, uh, you know, MMA camps is out here, uh, AKA. Shout out to AKA. Yeah. Um, Kane Velasquez, I used to work with him at Cardiff Lounge. Yeah, yeah. Kane Velasquez used to be a, uh, you know, a bouncer at Cardiff Lounge, you know, before he became the world champion, you know, UFC I heavyweight. <laughs> I really did hold Kane Velasquez's belt. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I said, Joe Rogan would definitely be uh, one of them. Um, you know, because he's just in interested in everything and anything, and you know, obviously, like his podcast is like one of the biggest podcasts in the world. It and, is the biggest. Yeah, podcast and in the he world. just, you know, if he gets an idea or he wants to learn about something, okay, I just want to learn about this. So I'm gonna go get this person. Or I'm gonna get that person, and he gets them. You know, he's had 
Elon Musk or like Neil deGrasse like Elon Tyson. Elon smoke weed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this shit made his stocks drop. You know, but definitely like Joe Rogan, I like that, you know. You know, maybe a couple comedians just to kind of, you know, talk shit, whatever I like. That'd like, be dope. Like Bill Burr is like one of my favorite comedians. He has his podcast too, the uh, Monday Morning Podcast, and he just talks to himself and every once in a while he'll have a guest on or his wife will come in the room he'll stop chop start chopping it up with his wife and whatnot so that's like one of the things i like um you know on a local level you know maybe you know other business owners people we know like say george uh, sanchez from yeah, chachos you definitely he, get george on the show for you know sure. he has i mean he's been through a lot he has an amazing story he's one of the hardest working people i've ever met yeah he is you know um he would be great to have on here Again, people... Uh, and he's he, entertaining we, as shit. Yeah, yeah he He's is. a fucking character. But yeah, so... I, you know, I just... My brand is part of the culture. And I just... A lot of people, I feel like, limit what they can do. Or they think, hey, you can only, like, do this. Or if you sell clothes, like, you only can sell clothes. But for me, I just... I wanted a company and a brand that I can just go into anywhere I wanted... It is very art based, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like a huge, like I'm not a big technology person. I use technology a lot, but part of the culture, the main goal was I wanted to be part of the music industry. I wanted to be part of the clothing industry. I wanted to be, you know, part of, I wanted to be in nightlife. I wanted yeah. to be in, I didn't want walls. I, I'm religious. I wanted to be able to, if I want to talk about God, it's a platform. Joe doesn't believe in God, but <laughs> I don't even we're, really we're not believe in <laughs> But you know, it's it's a platform to where I don't want to be com like I don't want no walls. I don't want no one to tell me like, oh, you can only do this or you can only do that. I feel like that gets boring. I get bored very easily. Yes, yes. So yes, as, we do. As far as uh, that was a I, that was sneak dissing. <laughs> <laughs> as far as this podcast and everything, thank you for being on, but. I just wanted to be part of a lot of cultures, you know, and I thank you for being a part of that. Definitely. You know what I mean? Definitely. Um, we're going to we're gonna end it there. So I'm JD. You can find me at, at partoftheculture.com or you can find me at Part of the Culture, spelled normal, on uh, Amazon. I have a book. It's Part of the Culture's 10 Steps to Level Up. It'll help you out in business. It, it's all the principles I've learned since I started business. Just very simplified. It's a guide. It's only 30 40 pages. I think you can get that for like three bucks for the ebook or ten bucks for the hardcover, or you can go to partoftheculture.com and get it completely free. I give a, I email you the ebook for completely free. But yeah, follow me, check me out, and and uh, where can they find you at, Joe? Oh, uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at uh, Joe Morgia. And I'll no uh, spell that. Yeah, spell yeah. that out. <laughs> That's a J O E M U R G U I A. So yeah, Joe Morgia. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook at Jose Morgia. Yes. You know, Jose, real name, but everyone calls me Joe. I call him Joey now. Not, nah, don't be calling me Joey anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it. You can find us on social media, and this is uh, part of the culture of the podcast. Thank you guys for joining. Part of the culture, Joe Sexual and JD. We are out. Peace. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that was fucking dope. Dude. That was good. That was, that was good. a good conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good little flow going. <laughs>